All right, welcome back in to Farscast. Uh, we are recording this live on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Farzibusugan. For those of you that are listening to the podcast version of this, uh, occasionally we do uh, some of our, or recently I've been doing all of my guest hits live on Facebook. So, and they are, they're not really scheduled because, you know, sometimes I'll have guests on different times, different days. So, it's kind of abrupt, but uh, you know, make sure you're following me on Facebook if you want to get a notification whenever we get to do one of these. Because I definitely like it when we do live interaction with our uh, with our listeners. So uh, Zach, of course, guest co-hosting with me. I'm very excited to talk to this guy. Uh, I had him on my Chiefs podcast last season uh, near the end of the year, um, and yeah, you know, I've talked to so many former players, Hall of Famers. But uh, this guy's been one of my favorites uh, and, you know, makes sense. He's very conversational. He's got a Chiefs podcast of his own over at the Believe Podcast Network. They've got a lot of cool guys there. I've interviewed a couple of them on my podcast, Eddie Law, Jason Brown. And now this guy, former Kansas City Chiefs offensive lineman, has one of the coolest records in NFL history. We'll get into that later. Joe Valerio. Joe, long time no talk, man. How have you been? Bars and how are you? Thank you, Zach. Great to see you guys. Thanks for having me on. This is uh, super exciting. I am not at Arrowhead Stadium uh, in the upper level. I am actually in, in Philadelphia. So I, I use this as my background to make me feel like I'm in Kansas City and enjoying a Red Friday, you know, getting ready for a big Sunday game. Um, but now it's great to be on Farzan. Uh, so uh, enjoy following you on social media and, and your podcasts and all that you do out there, uh, you know, covering sports and covering the world. So thanks. Thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun and, and a treat for the night. No, I appreciate that. Before we get into, first of all, um, I, I don't know if you remember DJ, he was another one of my uh, co-hosts mm -hmm. last year. Um, I, I, I've tried to have him on, but he's had so much. Uh, I mean, he's been busy with a lot of things. Uh, he wanted to say hello. Uh, he, he wanted me awesome. to tell you that. So uh, well, I'll pass well, that along. I said hello. Before we get into anything, Zach has a really funny story. You and Zach almost had an opportunity to meet. Zach was actually living in New York. He moved back to Kansas uh, when the pandemic hit and all. But Courtesy Zach, of COVID. Hooray, uh, hooray. Zach, go ahead and explain your story of how you guys almost met. Was this the one over at uh, John Brown? Is that the one we're talking about yes. here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest place to watch a Chiefs game if you're on the Eastern Seaboard, in my opinion. Though, to be fair, that's a lot of Seaboard to cover, so I've only limited experience. But, my God, just... Yeah, you know, I guess we were ships passing in the night in that regard because that was like the one week I think I saw that you were you know, tweeting now that you were going to go and uh, you'll be enjoying the game over at the Spoke House. And that was like, that was my spot, oh. honestly, for catching Chiefs games in the city. And, you know, that was just like, it you know, just so happened that that was the one week. Like, oh, well, so to be fair, I think I missed two weeks, uh, you know, two Sundays at that spot. Dante Hall came in one, you came in the other. Oh, so man. I guess the moral of the story is, you know, go to the John Brown Smokehouse when I'm not there because someone else really cool is going to be there. <laughs> oh, well, you probably spent a lot of time, Zach, with Tony Richardson because I know that was a big hangout for him. I know he was always there. Never actually got to meet him. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, you know, he's he was he lives not very far from there. And unfortunately, I don't know if you guys know this, but the John Browns that we went to in, in, in Queen City there actually, in mm -hmm. Long Island City, is actually closed. They're closing that yes. location oh. and moving. So I say, do you know where they moved to? I, I don't I heard that they the reopened, but I have no idea where. I don't know. I mean, between John Brown Smokehouse and Big Charlie's in South Philadelphia, it doesn't get any better than that on the East Coast to watch a Chiefs game. And, uh, you know, I've known the guys from Big Charlie's for years. That's my dad used to watch the games in South Philly. I was, you know, I was born in South Philly. My dad was a, a boxer in South Philly. So, you know, that was his. No statues though, right? That's where he was. No, no, no the Rocky statue that they, you know, <laughs> they say they modeled it after my dad, but, um, See, but you know, go. so he, um, but yeah, so we, we, you know, we loved seeing the game there at John Brown's AFC championship game last year. It was so exciting. Uh, you know, God, 2020 had such high hopes at that point right? it started so well <laughs> peace win the super bowl and you know next thing you know i've been in you know i've been in my house since you know march 12th um but yeah it was such a it started out such a great year but you know but hey look a lot of lessons we're learning from from all this stuff and dealing with it and uh you know just hoping people stay safe and do the right thing but sorry i missed you zach yeah that would have been nice to have some burn ends and and some next time once the world you know once we're allowed to resurface again we'll make it happen Definitely, definitely. A lot of people were wondering what the heck was I doing up in New York, you know, for the game, living in Philadelphia. But we decided to take the take a trip up there. We took my daughter up, 
to New York and, uh, and, and we had a blast. So it was, I met one of her friends that she went to college with. So it, it was great. Neat, neat place to watch a game. I wanted sure. to ask you um, because uh, people, I mean, you've got such an interesting background. I, I know you didn't pl- have a long career in the NFL, but in the short time that you were in the NFL, you did a lot of unique things that not a lot of athletes got to do the four touchdown catches for an offensive lineman. That's another one, which I want to get into later, but uh, I think what's so interesting and I always think it's intriguing seeing former athletes get into the realm of media. And I was actually this week, cause I knew you were going to come on. I, I went to your YouTube page and I looked up some of your media clips when you were an intern, you were an intern at KNBC in Kansas city. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think what's so cool is you might be the only player in team history to have worked with both Len Dawson and Joe Montana at the same time. Not a lot of people get to say, obviously, you know, you're working with Len in, in, the, in the newsroom and TV, but um, this whole transition, you're doing a podcast now with the Believe Podcast Networks. What is it like being a former player and bringing that perspective, perspective and also providing that commentary as a former athlete? Right, Farzan, that's a great question. I, you know, to, just to go back to the KNBC thing, you know, my, my whole goal, you know, I knew that football was going to end, right? And we used to have a saying in the locker room, there's an old Chiefs friend of mine, Mike Bell, played defensive line, you know, 80s and, and very early in the 90s and then retired, had a nice long career. He always used to say, it ends for everybody, just some sooner than others. And, you know, I always knew that it was going to come to an end. I was, a, I was a realist about that, no matter how long it was going to be. And, you know, if you're lucky and you play until you're 35, right, which is, all, you know, I know there's guys that play in their 40s, but, you know, 35 is like ancient, right? You get, you get a good 12, 13-year run, and you still have half your life to live, you know? So yeah. you, you start thinking about, I know I have to do things in, in the future. And so I did an internship at KNBC because I, oh, I was always very interested in media and broadcasting and, and sort of just hang, being around sports. I, I, love, I love sports. I love my, my wife and my kids joke, I'll watch anything. I'll watch the cornhole, you know, bago tournaments on ESPN. I'll watch mud car racing, you name it. I'll watch it. I love, we love sports. We love competing and doing all those things. And um, so I knew I was always going to be, I wanted to be around it. And so I interned at KNBC and when I did it, I didn't, had no intention of being on air. Like that was, that was like the last thing I want to do. I wanted to learn the business side of it. I spent time with the programmers, the engineers, I spent times with this with the salespeople. I used to cram into, you know, this there was this one great salesperson who would cram into to his car. He had like a Toyota Celica, you know, I'm cramming this thing. I was six five, three hundred and twenty pounds, and I'd jam in and we go visit like his clients trying to sell airtime. And then I would show up like, what the hell's he doing here? So we had a blast. And and all of a sudden, I was goofing around one day and uh, they said, Hey, would you wanna would you wanna do some some commercial work? So I said, sure, because Dodge was looking for somebody to do some trivia commercials. And they said, look, you know, you got this whole touchdown thing going. People will recognize, come on and do these. You're interning here. You're around. You might as well do it. So they're like, hey, you're pretty good with that teleprompter. Have you ever done this before? And I said, no, actually, I haven't. So what happened was Dave, so that kind of went silent for about a month. And then what happened was the, the season, the off season ended and the season started. And it was a Tuesday morning and I was sitting at home, right? Cause that was our day off. Right. And, and I think I was either getting ready to go to my, uh, you know, tr- uh, treatment session and get a lift in, you know, on my day off. And all of a sudden the phone rings and it's Dino Dinovitz, who's the general manager at the station and, and um, John Crumley, who was the sports editor, who's still there and still a great friend of mine. He calls me and says, Hey, Joe, what are you doing today? I said, well, it's my day off and get my, get a little lift in, get my treatment and, and just kind of chill out, get ready for a big day Wednesday. And he said, well, listen, would you be able to come in tonight and guest spot on the sports and the six and 10? Cause Len Dawson's in New York shooting um, HBO inside the NFL with Nick Bonacani. So I said, well, yeah, sure. Why? That'd be great. What happened? Well, we'll tell you when you get here. So I get there. Dave Stewart, right? You guys, Kansas yeah. City, everybody knows, I've interned knows for him. Dave. Really nice guy. Dave, Dave, Dave had an he had a, a weightlifting accident. I'm probably breaking HIPAA laws here. Who knows what I'm, you know, breaking? But but he had a weightlifting accident, and he was out, and he was like in traction, like he was laid out, like he was no way he was getting out of bed, and they said Karen Kernacki has to go 
uh, on, on site somewhere. So we need somebody to do the six and 10 because Len's not here. I was like, oh, so I ended up doing the six and 10. And they were like, well, what are you doing tomorrow? Because Len used to take Tuesdays and Wednesdays off to do HBO. And I said, well, I, I have a job. I had practice. Like, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm a lineman on this team. And, and this was, this was um, you know, 1994 or 93. And so they said, well, would you, you come in and do it? And I, so I, I, ha- I said, well, I got to call Carl. And Dino and Carl Peterson, Dino Dimmons, they were like, they were tight because KNBC used to do the, the Chiefs uh, preseason games. So he says, Carl, would you mind if Joe hustled out afterwards and did the news for us on on Wednesday night? And Carl's like, no, it's crazy. As long as he doesn't miss anything team related, there's no conflict of interest there. So showered up after practice, I hustled down I-70, right? Boogieing into town. And they had a spot waiting for me. They ushered me in. It was like, I got to the stadium or at the stadium. I got it to the station at like six twelve, and I was going on at like six eighteen, And, oh. and so I went on, I did it. And they were like, well, Joe, what are you doing next Tuesday and Wednesday? <laughs> like, so then it became a gig and it was That's incredible. Awesome. And then I did it for two years. And then that, that led to a radio gig with, uh, with the Fox. Right. So I did the one-on-one, the Fox uh, post game show for a couple of years. Um, I would, you know, go after the game and then I would have like, of course I had a pipeline to players. I'd bring them in and we'd, uh, you know, talk stories, talk, talk about the game. I'd interview some players. We'd, we'd, I'd give my analysis and take questions from the fans. And I'm telling you, it was so much fun. It was so much fun to connect that way with the city and with the fans. And it was so funny. Cause you know, my wife and I would go to a mall and somebody would go, Oh, you're the guy from channel nine and be like, yeah, I had this other job. I played for the Chiefs. They're like, oh, I just thought you were, were, were for Channel Nine. <laughs> I didn't even know I played for the Chiefs. So yeah, it was it was it was a lot of fun, guys, to to do that and to be a part of it. And um, I always promised the guys I would never break any confidence, you know. And and I told that to Marty, to Coach Schottenheimer, and to Carl. You know, I promised that I would always keep it positive and and never never give anything away that they didn't want me to give away. Well- I, I did want to ask you something, and I understand that whole, you know, you're a part of the team. Obviously, there are a lot of things you can't reveal, but I, I feel like a lot of times you hear you hear athletes, they don't like what some of the commentary you hear with local talk radio hosts or even national guys on ESPN, NFL Network, wherever, mm-hmm. and you sometimes see these guys spar on social media, and I'll give you one example. I remember last year when the 49ers had their really good run in the regular season, Richard Sherman had this odd press conference where he's talking to the media saying, you know, you all doubted us. Don't, 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 don't say positive things about us now. I don't want you. And, you know, my problem with that is, you know, as a member of the media, you're, you're going to be wrong sometimes with your predictions and your opinions, but you can't pick everyone to go 16 and 0. You can't pick everyone sometimes. to be a number. I mean, yeah, sometimes. Uh, you can't pick everyone to uh, be a number one pick. And if you project someone to go, you know, in the second round, you're, you're considered a hater. If you pick someone to go th- three and 13, you're a hater. Where do you draw that line of former athletes that, you know, you understand what the media has got to do. And, and, you know, you, they can't always say positive things. And, and it's not because they're haters. It's based on what they see on the sure. field. It's a, it's realism, right? I mean, what, to, you know, it's been since 1972, since a team has gone undefeated in the NFL, right? And the Chiefs is as good as they are this year, they lost two games, um, a game they you know probably should have won against the Raiders, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the last game is a little bit of a throwaway. But and Marty, don't coach Schottenheimer, please, you know, don't I would never say that about a game. But you know, I, I've got it, he's got it burned into me that you know, you, you prepare to win every game. <laughs> But I think as a, when I was doing it, luckily, Farzan and Zach, I was, you know, the, the editors and, and, and the producers at KNBC put me, always put me in a good position that I kept it positive and light. And I always focused on the positive side, did some human interest stories and things like that. So I never really got involved in making predictions about whether we were going to win, right? Because of course, I'm going to say we're going to win. Well, yeah, they, can't, they couldn't put me. Yeah, now, you to, can't say no when you got to go out on the field and do it. Right, right. <laughs> now, today as a podcaster, you know, as much as I love the Chiefs, you know, I'm an objective football fan. You know, I'm an objective football person. Um, and and I, so I always try to go into our podcast with knowing that, you know, the vast majority of people that listen to Jeff Fedoten and I are Chiefs fans. And, and, and I think I've recruited some other just like football fans because we don't always talk just about the Chiefs, right? Because there's a, there's a lot of insights that I like to give into our podcast and into my, and the things that I like to talk about, about what it's like to be a player 
and and to really give the listeners and, and the people that I come in contact with every day at work, even, you know, in, in my in my job, right, in, in, the, in the insurance industry, is they want to know, you know, what were some of those, what's the inside baseball, you know, what are the things that players are preparing for? What are they doing? Because I don't think fans, even today, with all the social media stuff, I don't think fans still get a real good picture of what it's like to be a player and the things that you have to deal with. And, and so that's what I always tried to do. And, and I think you draw the line bars and is just being, being honest, because I think if I just went in every week to our podcast and said, Oh, the chiefs are going to beat the Raiders. The chiefs are going to beat this team. I mean, I've predicted the chiefs losing in games. I didn't, I honestly didn't think when Drew Brees made the surprise start, um, I didn't think the Chiefs were going to win that game against the Saints. I thought the Saints, to use a, to quote a Marty Schottenheimerism, you know, the, the Saints had way more to lose by losing that game than the Chiefs had to win. And that's how Marty always used to judge things. You know, he he judged emotions by whoever has more to lose tends to win. And 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 it's not a hundred percent rule, but it's definitely an 80-20 type rule where you know the emotion of you know, that fear of losing. And there, I know there's a lot of even psychological laws about that. You know, the yeah. fear of the fear of, of losing that, of, of, of being in an adverse situation is actually stronger than the desire to win. And I didn't think they'd win that game. And I was able, I was, you know, I don't think I lost a lot of Chiefs fans, you know, for that, for saying, because I have to be, obje- I think you have to be objective, even as an ex-player. So I've always found that when I watch, you know, ESPN or, I watch any of the sports, you know, folks that are on, I really gravitate towards the ones that are really objective and, and lay out a lot of facts and data and don't let too much emotion get into it. Um, Because if you, if you let that get into it, I don't know, it kind of takes away from the fun of it. I think. I think you're absolutely on point with that. Though I guess I'm curious, you know, with that in mind, you know, just get the amount of kind of call it inside baseball that you guys are able to deliver there. I'm curious your opinion, you know, obviously as a former lineman, that's been the one spot I feel like this year that we've struggled the most. And I mean, I'm sure other Chiefs fans will argue with me on that, but I mean, how can you just walk me through how hard is it, you know, for you know, guys like Mike Remmers, for example, where, you know, he's just kind of that swing tackle. You got to know what to do from both sides. Can you walk us through just like how hard it is to be able to, you know, hammer out, hammer down at a you know, high level, any of those positions on the line and, you know, really what, what these guys are dealing with week in and week out when they're having to make that sort of a switch. Sure. Um, Zach, I'll touch on one point that you, when you, when you said that brought, brought up a thing and why it's not a problem for the chiefs is if you watch Patrick Mahomes, his, some of his best throws and his best plays happen when things are falling all apart around him. Yeah. And I think that is a huge advantage for the Chiefs line and why they have dealt with moving guys around so well and and some of the injuries and the shuffling and and some of the chemistry that you know they've 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 didn't have like they had last year I think a lot of it hinges on Patrick Mahomes and and I'll tell you he has an unbelievable knack for finding the open space in in the pass protection and I think that's why some teams like the saints didn't, you know, the saints kind of contained him, you know, and, and what the, what the saints did is they did what I would call a mush rush. So they didn't, they didn't do your typical speed defensive ends, you know, linebacker rush types on the edge, your big hulking defensive tackles coming right up the middle to collapse the pocket. They kind of rushed almost like in unison. And it was almost like a, like a march that they were doing because they knew they could not give Patrick that open space. Cause you know, when, 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 you, when the, when the tackles go out wide or the defensive ends go out wide around the offensive tackles and, and, and he just has a way, a knack of finding that little open space. And so I think the chiefs linemen are at a distinct advantage having a Patrick Mahomes because you see when, when like the Patriots in the, in the days of old or the Dan Marino or John Elway, those big drop back quarterbacks, just the hulking big, big dudes that are back there with cannon arms. When you, you know, you got at, you got at them a little bit, the whole game collapsed for them. So when you had an, a lineman get hurt and you, you were missing your starting right guard or your starting left tackle, things got scary for them because they needed to, to, to be almost like old school 
right? You needed to have the, you know, the, the typical prototypical left and right tackle. You needed to have the right center, the right guards uh, in there in the game to, to protect the pass rush, to keep the bull rush from happening in the middle and, and to, you know, make sure you're funneling those defensive ends around the edge and let Tom Brady, have his four seconds right in the middle of the pocket. Cause you see how he gets, he gets out of the pocket. It's like, it's all over the place. Right. And it's really hard, Zach. It's hard. It's, you know, the, the speed and, and the, the incredible strength of the defensive players these days, I, I, don't, I don't think I would, I'd be able to make it today. You know, I don't, with the athletic ability I have. I don't know. You had some big dudes across the line from you. I mean, you'd lined up with Big Dan across from you in practice. So I don't know yeah, if I totally buy that. But. I know, but, you know, these guys today, I mean, you know, you look at some of these defensive tackles and they make Dan Salamua look, you know, and he'd be the first guy to Fair. admit it. No offense to Dan, they'd make him look small. You know, these six foot three, 250, 350 pound defensive tackles that run, you know, four sixes, four sevens. You're like, what? Are you kidding me? You know, and, and, and some of these guys that big shouldn't move that fast. Laws of physics disagree. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I think, I think, I think it's when you see a team invest in their offensive line, and I think the Chiefs have done that. You know, I think Andy Heck and, 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 Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy as the coordinator, I think they've done a fantastic job. You bring in – people are wondering, bringing back Wisniewski? What the heck's that all about, you know? You, you bring in a Remmers. They, you, you looked at – they haven't really missed a beat, you know, not having Mitchell Schwartz, right? LDT's, you know, doing his thing in Canada and taking care of COVID patients. God love him. What a yeah. hero he is, right? God, I tip my hat to him. But, you know, so they – they're, they're rebuilding this line and, and it's like it's like they really now Patrick's a big part of that the, the new found running game is a big part of that but you know they they you know those guys just um they did a great job with the depth I I, I think they're you know I think their line is has really played well and and I think um it's it's not easy trust me to go to bounce around from position to position uh, because you do get used to the footwork and you get used to the types of techniques that you need to use at a certain position because they are different mm -hmm. and it can be it can be a it can be a challenge yeah i mean i likened it to like trying to write with your left hand when you're a righty yeah um, making the <laughs> jump from the yeah. left and right side of the uh, i mean i was a guard so i wasn't that helpful but <laughs> um yeah <laughs> oh, even that was just tough you know but that's at a high school level which obviously yeah yeah you know, substantially different the other question i had is just the other side of the moving parts there is like how hard is it when you've got, you know, you, you've got your general locked down spot. How hard is it when you've got someone new coming off your left or right shoulder that you just, you know, obviously you got chemistry because you're all in that same locker room together, generally speaking, during the week. But, you know, how, how different is that on game day and knowing like, all right, you know, I've got Will Shields over here. We know he's going to do this, you know, versus right. if he gets hurt, who else comes in? Obviously, terrible example. He didn't get hurt but you get my point. <laughs> no, Zach, I totally, that, that is probably the toughest part. Individually. I think the players all have the skills, you know, you, you get to the NFL and, you know, unlike me, I didn't really play against great competition. You know, I mean, I joke, I was blocking Biff McNutty from Harvard and six months later, I'm going against Howie Long. Like what the heck just happened? You know, how did that happen? Um, but like, so individually it's guys can make the, they can make the switch. I think the different positions, I think you nailed it, Zach, when you said it's that it's not just the chemistry in the locker room. We all have that. We all know that this guy's got my back and we're going to go to war together and we're going to do all those things together as teammates and, and, and you build that bond, but that physical chemistry that you have to build with players, that's probably the trickiest part for an offensive lineman because there's two Two main two main areas that can break down. Number one is in zone blocking, right? So I co I coached you know high school football for about eleven years. I was coaching the line and 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 you know we were a, we were a zone blocking team. We were a triple option team. So it was all about combos. Everything was combo block, combo block, combo block. And and we used to do drill after drill after drill with guys getting their hips together. And I'm telling you, there is a timing there that you can only get through muscle memory and repetition. 100%. And you throw a different player in there who has different body shape, different speed feet, different strength level, and it throws everything off. 
And that's yeah, in the run. Hard game. to do a combo block when your guy can't get the job done. But totally, it. Zach. So you played guard. You know what it's like to combo with the center on a nose guard who's trying to split you, or you know you're you're trying to combo with the tackle on an outside veer play or whatever. And and I think the other one, and that happens also in the passing game too. You know, we used to practice and rep over and over and over again. You know, the passing of the stunts, right? And and mm-hmm. that's the first thing that a defensive coordinator or a defensive line coach is going to attack when they see a new line. Right. So, you know, that's, I mean, I don't know. For me, that was the hardest part figuring out pass pro and especially the, you know, trading off there. Cause like if you're not entirely on the same page, that's a free run and your guys getting blasted. Totally. And, and that to me is, you know, it's that chemistry. So, you know, um, and I'm not just like patting myself on the back, but that's one of the things that we used to do when I was coaching. We always rotated our players through with different players. They always, well, I, I, I'm going to be playing with Brandon the whole game. You know, no, we're going to, you're going to take reps today with, you know, Jim, mm-hmm. because you, you had to make sure that you were able to work together because you never knew when somebody was going to get, you know, dinged or they needed to go in or get a penalty, come out of the game, whatever. You knew that that was going to happen sometime during the season. It's a long year. And I think, you know, I think that's what really good offensive uh, coaches do. And, and I think that's what, you know, Andy Heck is doing. I know Alex Gibbs did it with us, Art Shell, Howard Mudd. You know, I go through the, the the great offensive line coaches that I had. We were always rotating through. You know, we, we were all, always – I'll never forget the first time I had to rotate through with Joe Montana as quarterback. You know, granted, granted, Joe was not a shotgun quarterback. He was under center, which you don't even see anymore. Like, you don't even see quarterbacks getting under the center anymore. I'll never forget that first Except time. Except for that, you know, sneak. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which w- will never happen again, ever, right? Not for us, probably, um, but still uh, incredibly effective. Yeah, I I saw Joe Montana coming over. They're like, all right, they're like, you know, um, Alex Gibbs, like, hey, Joey, get, he called me Joey. He's like, hey, Joey, get in there and, and take some rest with Joe. I was like, I was like, me, me, me. You, you want me? You, you know, want me to snap to him? I I'll never forget the ball that I snapped to him was the most gingerly snap I ever did in my entire career, high school, college, or NFL. I was so fearful I was going to be the guy that like on his first snap in training camp, broke Joe Montana's middle finger, you know, oh, on no. the snap. I, I literally, I should have probably just picked it up and turned and handed it to him. I was so afraid I was going to hurt him with the snap. And, and, you know, they were like, Joe, it's okay. He's taking snap a lot of the ball. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, funny. That, that's the kind of stuff that goes through your mind, right? When you got, you know, yeah. you got a legend there behind you. Well, talking about your playing career, man, uh, you've got one of the coolest records. I, I think the only record that could have been cooler would have been Dan Connolly if he would have had that kick return touchdown on that Sunday night game. I don't know if you remember that. but How cool would that have been? I, I'm sure you were going crazy when that happened. But um, you have the record for most touchdown receptions in NFL history by an offensive lineman. You have four touchdown grabs. Um, we talked about this a little bit last year, but for those that maybe have not listened to you talk about this before, when, when did you, when did this whole idea first happen about, you know, you, you're going to, you know, line up as a tight end, you're going to be an eligible receiver and we're going to throw the ball to you in the end zone. Like yeah, as an offensive lineman, you're just thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pancake some guys. That's going to be my <laughs> right? career highlight. Well, you know, whenever I, you know, well, look, when an offensive lineman touches a football, something bad happened, right? Uh, you know, you saw the, the catch. How about that catch Stefan Wisniewski had? Was that fantastic? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, yeah. I was so mad they didn't right? let Make me him a t- get ineligible. But that was incredible. Travis who? Um, <laughs> but, but like when, 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 uh, you know, I was in, in 90, my rookie year and my second year, right. You have to remember we were, we were smash mouth, right. I mean, Christian Okoye, Barry word, right. Bill Jones, our fullback. Like it was dive, right. Dive left play action pass. You know, we threw the ball maybe 20 times a game, but, you know, so I was always, and, you know, you can't carry three big tight ends, right? Cause you know, you, you just can't, you don't, you know, Jonathan Hayes was our biggest tight end. He was our star starter and everything on, on the offense. And, and, but you only have one Jonathan, all your other tight ends are either like H backs or whatever. So I was always, because I was a backup lineman, I was always like the, the, we called it the tank formation. I was always the extra lineman that would come in and be, you know, in short yardage and goal line, just, just to block. Right. Because we didn't have big tight ends to, to cram, you know, you're cramming the ball up to get, you know, a yard or two. So 91, 92, so I'm tank tight end. And then 93, you know, we go West coast offense and just, we, the playbook just we, we blew it up threw it away Paul Hackett puts in you know this all these crazy plays and so we're out of practice one day and we had this one play 
where I was still the tank tight end. I would come in and I would go like five yards into the end zone and I would just plant myself there. Right. I barely, I used to wear pads. They were so big. I couldn't put my hands over my head. So I put, I put my hands up and, and I was basically a screen. Right. So, you know, Keith Cash, Willie Davis, you know, JJ Bird and they're, cro- they're doing crossing routes and I'm just, I'm there to take up space. So one day we're at practice and, and Joe's, you know, calls a play in the huddle. And I'm telling you, like, I was, I wasn't even like the fourth check down. I was like, they would throw it. He, Joe was supposed to throw it away before he would throw it to me. Right. Like that's how, like, that's how far down the chain I was. Right. And so Joe being Joe, right. He gets back there and he's, he's pumping the ball and, and, and I'm looking at him and he's looking right at me. Right. And I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Right. Like, and all this is happening in like split seconds. Right. I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. And he's, you know, JJ's wide open. Keith cash is wide open and he's pumping the ball and he's pumping it. And he's like getting all this arm strength in. I'm like, Whoa, Whoa. And he fires the thing at me. I know exactly what he was doing. And he admitted he was trying to hit me in the face. Right. And, and it was like, Oh, Joe, you know, a big glute, you know, and, 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 and I caught the thing and I snagged it out of the air and Paul, I was, I was a I played baseball in, in high school. I actually was going to play baseball in college. I actually, football was actually, I don't know, afterthought. I love the game, but I, I was actually, my intent all the way up through my senior year in high school was to play baseball in college. And so, but I went from 5'10 to 6'5, which is, that's a whole nother podcast, another story. So no more catching at 6'5, you know, 200 plus pounds. So I snagged this ball out Isn't of the Isn't that air. basically Salvi? <laughs> <laughs> So I snagged this thing and, and Paul Hackett, he like throws the this playbook up in the air. He runs, he goes, you, you can catch. I said, I don't know. What is this thing? I like, you know, threw it away like a hot potato. And, and he, he says, um, Joe, you are going to catch a touchdown pass this season. And I said, wow, coach, this West coast offense really does open things up. <laughs> I did see and, that. <laughs> and, 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 and I was like, are you kidding me? And, and he said, you know, so I became the wide receiver. And, and so we, he had it in the playbook and then he said, we're going to wait for the right time to run this. So we started putting it in, we started repping it. And then, and then it was that, that Raiders game uh, early on in the season, it was, you know, first and goal on the goal. And he figured, you know, coach figured, let's just surprise him with this. Who's going to think this big glute's going to go out and, you know, I nailed my guy. Now, of course we had Marcus Allen right? Who was literally the greatest around the end zone. I don't care what anybody says. I know he wasn't the biggest dude, but man, he could find the end zone around, around the goal line. And, and, and he made an unbelievable fake. Like he and Joe, it looked like he grabbed the ball and it was like, it, I thought he had the ball actually. I was like, Oh, I guess I'm not catching this. I think Marcus just dove in with it. And here I am standing out there and, and you know, everybody, all 11 guys piling on Marcus and Joe lays flutters that little thing out there. And then he threw it, man, that thing was perfect. Like he, that guy could throw a ball, man. Let me tell you, like it, it had just enough speed on it that it came to me, but not so much that it fluttered and made me think too much. Although I was kind of reading, you know, the NFL logo, it was, it was spinning around going, please, dear Lord, don't drop this thing. And, uh, and there it was. And, and, and it was like, all right, he can do it. So we just kept putting it in, putting it in and repping it at the right time. And, Man, I'll tell you, Coach Hackett always found, you know, first of all, the Raiders, right? Who you're a chief. Who doesn't want to score a game against the Raiders, right? Forget, yeah. forget that it's Joe Montana. That's a whole nother, you know, ball of wax, right? That I caught a touchdown from Joe Montana, but like it was the Raiders, you know, Raider week. And then and then and then we go the season, right? Nothing happens. And then I ran it a couple, you know, I we did I did run it in, in another game. We didn't, I wasn't open. Um, we ran it against the Falcons. Like we did, we did run the play other times. I just wasn't open. And so does uh, that mean someone like actually tailed and covered you? Is that what a couple I just of heard times you say? They did, Zach, okay. believe it yeah. or not. I was like, I, 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 I was going to ask, did teams, I mean, teams have to prepare for everything. I was, I was going to ask like, do teams, did teams actually act practice for those plays with you? I, or I, well, I guess the, about you. But, but, but well, Farzan, that's the thing. Like, you know, we talk about this all the time. Like, that's why, that's why I t- everybody was like, why would Andy run that weird play? Like the shovel pass or, you know, the, the, the Patrick Mahomes, you know, they tried to do what I called like the Kansas city's version of the Philly Philly the other week. Right. Where, you know, Patrick, I was like, please, Patrick, don't get hurt going for that ball, please dear Lord. Right. So, 
you know, the, the coaches do that all the time because they want, they want teams to have to take a valuable rep away from practice to go to, to, to draw it up on the cards for the scout team and have to run it during scout practice. They, that's why teams do those wacky plays. You know, there's a little, in, there's some inside baseball. They don't do it because they think it's always going to work and that it's so magically tricky. You know, the, the Travis Kelsey shovel pay. It's so that coordinators, when they break down their film, they say, we're going to have to rep that because we don't want to get embarrassed. You know, we don't want to do it. And then, and in the, in the times that I was scoring, teams just forgot like against the 49ers you know Ricky Jackson just just kind of like forgot about me as Marcus was diving over the top and you know that was uh that was the famous Eric Stone Street you know picture because he's he's actually in the picture like there's a there's a picture of where I'm I have my arms up in the air after I scored against the the 49ers and there's Eric Stone Street yeah he's like right behind me he's like two rows behind and um He's in the picture. So it's just wild that, you know, Cam, right, from Modern Family's in the picture. But, um, yeah, it just kind of just took off. And then, you know, then the um, – so we did the 49ers one, and then, you know, and then all of a sudden it's Monday Night Football. Like, come on. Like, you know, so it's – so I got to score against the Raiders. I got to score against the, against the 49ers, which was, you know, the Joe Montana, Steve Young, September 11th, 1994 shootout, right, his Joe's redemption game against the Niners. And it was like, really? Like I got to score in that game. It's like, what, what, you know, my, my daughters call me Forrest Gump. We're like, well, you just, that's just like a Forrest Gump moment. And so, so then, so then, you know, we get, we get to that Monday night game. It's the Elway Montana shootout. Right. And, and I'm doing an ST plunge. It's like, what is going on? You know, like what's happening to me? <laughs> this is like happening. And it was like, it was so magical. Um, and then there was that, the, the double game with the, the touchdown against the Cardinals that I caught one from Steve Bono. And then there was the crazy 76 yard run, which when the quarterback from the, from the giants, you know, I know that got relived when the quarterback from the giants fell on that oh, 80 yeah. yard run, they were playing that Steve Bono run again, where I'm, I'm like out there. He was supposed to throw it to me, by the way, that was supposed to be a, a little dump pass, but the entire team. But the entire Buddy Ryan defense just collapsed on on Marcus and and Steve, you know, bootlegged out and, and I'm running down the field and I'm running and he's yelling at me, don't run faster than me. And I was like beating him in a foot race. And, you know, he, we still Steve and I still joke about that, that, you know, I, I probably was, you know, the only lineman that could beat him in a foot race. But um, he, uh, you know, so there was that there was that one. And so it just was, you know, far as my dad always said, Joey, you're going to make it to the Hall of Fame someday. I just didn't know it'd be on somebody else's plaque, but that's okay. So, you know, uh, you know, I'm on Joe Montana's like all time receivers plaque at the hall of fame. So, you know, my dad had a lot of, that's, that's awesome. That's cool. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I obviously when, when you play, there was no social media. And the reason Thank I bring that goodness. up, Thank you, goodness. I was just going to ask that. Is that, if you thought that was maybe a good thing, obviously the answer is yes, but you see a lot of times, we talked about this earlier with athletes and, you know, they, they take issue with some of the things that people say in the media, but now you've got fans that can, you know, connect with athletes. And I guess it's up to the athletes how they want. I've seen Tyreek Hill use, um, what's that uh, website where you stream video games? Um, Twitch. Yeah, he, okay. he's on Twitch sometimes and he'll, I, I don't know exactly what he does. I've never watched it, but I know he does that from time to time. Um, you know, I, I've seen even during a year where the Chiefs only lost two games, one with the starters, I guess, but a lot of Chiefs fans are very critical still. And you've seen Tyron Matthew. I mean, he does not hold back. He, he's on Twitter and he'll, he'll go after anyone that he doesn't like the criticism. Uh, Chris Jones, I guess he had a moment with someone in the, in the yeah. media this year. Yeah, um, that. yeah. Oh yeah. From 610. Um, so I, I'm curious, what is it like, you know, seeing athletes, and a lot of times, sometimes fans that try to instigate these arguments and try to get something out of these players. Yeah, well, it's just like, I mean, you know, the, my version, our version of, of social media back then was, you know, fans at the stadium. Like that was all we had. Like that was our social interaction, right? You know, you, you'd get, you know, you get booed when you go to play the Raiders, you get cheered when you come out at Arrowhead. So, you know, that was really the, our interaction. And, and then out in the community, right, of course, but, you know, personally, face to face, 
whether we lost a game or, or whether I didn't play well, or, you know, I did something that, you know, maybe caught somebody's eye, you know, in that personal interaction face to face, people are much less likely to come up to you and say, you know, Hey Joe, I saw that, you know, you jumped off sides on that play, you know, like they, they, they're just going to say, Hey, there's Joe, the chief and Hey, good game. You know, like they're, they have that short interaction. So when, when it's personal and it's physical and it's in person, people are going to be a lot less likely to be critical. Right. And, but when you can hide behind the wall of, of social media, it's easy to, you know, bust out, you know, you know, one of the players and just say, you know, you know, what's going on with this player? What's he doing? Why did he drop that? What's going on? And it's easy to be, it's easy to be a lot easier to be critical. I mean, we heard it a lot on talk radio, right? We, you know, we would hear it, you know, you, you listen to the drive home radio or whatever, and they're doing the chiefs talk or the sports talk and, you know, fans will call in and they'll say, ah, guy's a bum. And well, that's, that's a Philly term. Cause that's where I live. And that's the kind of radio I listen to here, it's but definitely, you know, yeah. Common but like, thread, isn't it? it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, listen, as a player, it's really hard. I don't care what anybody says. This it's, it's, this is what you do for a living. You know, I could only imagine like how people in my business now, if there was like, if someone, you know, got on a radio show and said, oh man, that guy just can't sell insurance, man. What a, what a, what jerk. a bum. you know, what a bum. He's a bum. Get him out of there. Hire somebody else. You know, it's just like, you have to learn how to, to take that as a player. And it's hard. It's hard because you're giving, you're giving it your all. You're doing whatever it is to, that it takes to get there. And, and you're giving, you know, your, your body, your soul, your mind, yeah. and, and you're trying to be a true professional, be good in the community and do the right thing. And, and there's always going to be haters. And, that, you know, it's one of the things, you know, my, my daughter has taught me a lot about social media. She's the communications director, you know, for the governor in Delaware. And, you know, my God, you know, the governor puts out a, you know, really awesome new program. And it's like, always right down the line, half the people are like, that's stupid, or and then half the people are that's great. It's like, and she just, she's taught me a lot about, you know, living with the, the, the you know, the criticisms and things like that through social media. And yeah. I, I just, it would have been hard for somebody like me, because I take things really personally. But then there's the positive side far and just by coming on your podcast, I was able to connect with two, two fans, you know, one fan had said, you know, he, he, had, he had put in the comment section, I had a chance to get a, a Joe autographed hat once on like eBay. And he said, I never did. And I, he goes, I regret it. I regretted not, you know, getting it. And, and so I saw that and I, I, I friended him, I sent him a, a direct message and I said, uh, listen, here's my address. Send, send me a hat. I'll, oh, I'll, sign awesome. it. I'll send it back to you. You know, and then we, you, you, you and I were texting about, you know, the one gentleman who was like, Oh, if you can get Joe, that'd be great. And I was like, Hey, I'll see you at seven 30 central time, you know, f fire up the computer. I'll see you then. So yeah, that, that ability to interact in a, in a positive way is really rewarding for, for some, especially someone like me, I've been out, you know, I've been out of the game since 1996, you know, it's 20, 25 years since I stepped onto a field and it's just really nice to reconnect. And to, even if it's a small moment that someone says, oh, I remember when you, you know, that I was at that game, you know, when you scored against the, you know, 49ers and, you know, me and my dad or, you know, whatever. And, and, or I remember when you came to our school to talk to us and it was really cool. You know, that kind of stuff does really mean a lot to somebody who's, who's been out of the game for a while. And as my dad said, you know, when, when I left football and got into insurance, he goes, let me tell you something, son, 70,000 people aren't going to cheer when you sell insurance. So, um, you know, my dad always, he, the best advice, you know, he, he had the, he had the best advice for me. Um, you know, he, he's, I think he's really part of the reason why I think I made it to the NFL. Um, and why I think, you know, cause he, he told me, look, when, when you do the work, you do it humbly and I'll keep this story short, but he, uh, I was going to do an, in, my, my wife, then girlfriend talked me into getting an internship my last year in college. And I didn't really want to do it. Cause I was so focused on football and so focused on school. And she's like, well, you know, your roommate, Pat's getting a, he got an internship at the stock exchange and, you know, Doug's working down at Nike, you know, in DC. And I was like, all right, all right, I'll get an internship. So my, I signed up for this internship through our, through our football office. And I was working for a financial advising firm. And, you know, I had like one short sleeve shirt that was two sizes too small. I had a tie that was like, I look like Mr. Incredible from the Incredibles, like when he was stuffing <laughs> the cubicle. And, you know, if there was ever a time in my life, I could have been a total jerk. And I tell this story to young people because not to brag on what I, where I was at my life, but to tell them that things change quickly. 
you know, if there was ever a time in my life, you know, I could have been a total jerk. It was that time in my life. I was captain of an Ivy League football team. I was an All-American. I way out kicked my coverage in, in the girlfriend department, right? I don't, I don't know what my now wife was doing with me. And, and you know, I was, you know, it just had, I had really good things going on in my life. But my dad, man, he like punched me in the gut and was like, Joey, when you go there to that work today, like my dad never went to an office. He was a professional boxer. He was a warehouseman, drove a truck. He'd never been in an office. He said, when you go to that office today, you do the work and you do it humbly. You hear me, son? I'm like, you got it, Pop. And he, my dad passed away when he was 76. He was a middleweight. I was 320. He was a buck 65. My dad would have kicked my butt. Like I didn't mess with my, my dad told me to do something. I did Those little guys, man. They're scrappy. Oh, my pops, man. And, and so I went to that job. I did it. I, I was, he said, you be nice to everybody. You treat everybody with respect. The, the boss, the big Mahoff doesn't matter. You custodian, anybody that's there, you treat them with respect. So six months later, I'm at the combine. I'm interviewing with Carl Peterson and Marty Schottenheimer and Howard Mudd at the hotel at the combine. And Carl Peterson asked the last question of the interview after they asked me, you know, how's your ankle that you twisted in eighth grade feel? You know, they do their homework, right? <laughs> so Carl says, Joe, tell me about your internship at Kidder Peabody this past summer. And I was like, oh, Mr. Peterson, I said, with all due respect, what does that have to do with running into 300 pound guys really fast? <laughs> he said, it has everything to do with it. He said, tell me about it. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I worked as a, a financial analyst and I did this, this. He goes, hey, did you, did you know a gentleman there by the name of Tim Sennett? And I said, oh, yeah, Mr. Sennett was Mahoff. And uh, he was, he was the bo my boss's boss's boss. And he goes, uh, yeah, he goes, you know, he's you know, one of my best friends and we're godparents, each other's kids and college roommates and all that stuff. He goes, everything he told me about the way you handled yourself in that internship is why we're going to draft you next month in the draft. And he said, no so what's... Way. He said, so what's the lesson you learned, Joe? And I said, well, Mr. Peterson, you never know who's watching. And he said, that's exactly right. Because Lamar Hunt wants people in this locker room who know what to do when no one's watching. Because anybody who comes to the combine can run and jump and throw and block and tackle and catch. He said, we, that's what we want. And that's why we're going to draft you next month. And, and I yeah, look, you know, it's just when I think back on that, you know, um, that could have changed my whole destiny. Right. And, and, and I didn't know what was going to happen in, in the draft. I didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, then all of a sudden the chiefs take a, a shot on the kid from Penn, not Penn state. Right. So I was, uh, you know, I tell that story because I think it just, it's that sort of the power of just do the right thing, you know, just do the right thing when, when, even when you, you know, no one's watching, you just got to do the right thing. Man. It's an awesome story. I would never have guessed that that would be where that was headed when it came right? to, you know, doing the yeah. financial advising thing. Like that's, wow. A lot blowing. of people don't, Zach. A lot of people in their lives don't, you know, they don't know where things are going. You know, they don't know where things are going. If, you know, if I, uh, you know, decided that I was going to take that playoff on, on, on you know, the, the, the one where Joe Montana decided to, to try to make a fool out of the, of the big fat offensive lineman, you know, I mean, you just, you just never know how things are going to work out. And I think everything, you know, kind of happens for, for, you know, for a reason. And, you know, even, even, even getting cut from the chiefs was, you know, a blessing in disguise for me. My wife was pregnant with triplets and uh, she had a really troubled pregnancy. And, you know, after I got released by the chiefs and then I had that cup of coffee with the Rams, you know, things were like, my whole world was crumbling. You know, I felt like I was at the end of my rope and, you know, I got three kids on the way. My wife has this troubled pregnancy and then, you know, my daughters were born extremely premature and, um, you know, they were, they were got the best of medical care. Um, and because we were back in Philadelphia, we were with our family. My wife got to see a doctor that she really trusted. And, you know, I got to spend that time, you know, with my wife in the hospital and she was in the hospital for seven weeks. And then my daughters were in the hospital for nine before they were wow. able to come home. So, you know, things just happen, you know, for a reason. And, and you just have to kind of go with it, I think, sometimes. And, you know, it's okay to, to all the lessons and, and to do that and, and to question your decisions and things like that. But, you know, sometimes I think you just got to realize that, you know, there's a reason why something happens. And, and as hard as that was to leave Kansas, City, that at the end, it was, you know, it was, it was kind of what needed to be and where I needed to be at that particular time. Um, so, yeah, so it's it it crazy how that stuff works out.
Uh, follow that farce. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, to, to follow up with that, Zach. But, um, you know, I, I think it's so interesting, just everything you've done in your career. But uh, I, I did want to ask you a question I, I forgot to ask. A lot of people aren't talking about this with Andy Reid uh, as the Chiefs get ready for the playoffs. Um he is about to coach his 11th playoff game with the Chiefs. That's going to be more than any coach in Chiefs history. Uh, Marty coached 10 games. Um, and if he wins the divisional game, which we don't know who, who it's going to be yet, but if he wins that game, he's also going to own the record. And I think he's going to be, yeah, he's currently tied with Hank Stram for most playoff wins as the head coach of the Chiefs. Can you just talk about the job Andy Reid has done? I, and I know I, I was very critical of him last year after, after that Tennessee game, but, you know, he, he wins those three playoff games in dramatic fashion too uh, with, you know, the 24 nothing start, and then you finish with a 21-point unanswered run to, to end your uh, playoff run and finally get that ring. What do you make of the job that Andy Reid's done with this football team? Um, I think it was just eight years ago, a couple of days ago, he signed with the team, and look where it is now. Yeah, as far as it's uh, look, it's not easy, man, to coach in the NFL. Just look, just people, people have such short memories about what it really takes. I mean, what's it been since two thousand and three? Since there's been a, a back-to-back Super Bowl winner, is that am I right with that Patriots? I think, so. I think oh, you're correct. Three hundred four. Yeah, three hundred four. I mean. That's it's hard. It's hard yeah. to create the chemistry year in and year out, especially dealing with things like free agency and the turnover and and the, the you know the lack of chemistry that you see these even the dynasties have had right and how hard it was to even keep that Patriots team together year in and year out and and some of the you know the job that like Belichick and Brady did. It is so hard. You know these coaches they they take over a team. You get you get one or two years to really turn it around. If you don't, you're out. It's like you don't really – these coaches don't have a whole lot of runway, and Andy's a winner. I mean, what more could you ask for? They, you know, he, they've, 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 they've made the playoffs, you know, every time. You know, they, they, they've, they've won games. They won the Super Bowl. You know, <clears throat> he's built a team that people can really be proud of. Um, he's surrounded himself with coaches that are <clears throat> just, A, number one, fantastic, right? If Eric Bieniemy is not a head coach somewhere, I may not watch another NFL game next year because the guy, you know, we came out in the same draft in 1991. I have so much respect for him. Oh. The guy's got to be a head coach somewhere. Okay, that's it. Flat, plain and simple, that's it. I'm done with that. He better be a head coach and and because he deserves it. Um, he just surrounds now Where do you think he goes? That's the real that's question. That's the question, right? Who wouldn't want to have him? I don't know. I, it's, that's a tough one, Zach, to, to try well, I guess- to guess that one. Honestly, a better question, maybe. I mean, I don't know if it's better, but similar question. You're in his shoes. Which gig do you want? Oh man, I don't know. How about you? What do you guys think? What do you? Where, See, you... I I want to say the Texans because you've got Deshaun yeah. Watson, but got... man, they've got such a crazy situation with <clears throat> their salary cap and the and the limited amount of draft picks. Yeah. Um. I, maybe that's a short term issue. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, where where that ends up for him. But, you know, but Andy, you know, I met Andy Reid on his in his first month as the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I was, you know, I was doing some stuff with the um, the Eagles chapter um, of retired players. And, and the nice thing about it is, is, is the NFL is this really great, you know, fraternity of guys that, you know, even if you're not, you know, I grew up in Philly. Um, I wasn't, I never played for the Eagles. I, I took a free agent visit here. I never played for them though. And, um, you know, I, I actually, in a very crazy story, Harry Gamble, who was the general manager of the Eagles in, in 1990, when, you know, 91, when I got drafted, 90 was my last college season. He, he was like, I saw him at, at the Maxwell awards in, in Philadelphia. And he was like, uh, Hey Joe, he goes, good luck with, you know, Mr. Peter. Cause Harry used to coach at Penn. And he said, good luck with uh, Mr. Peterson. I said, oh, I'm so looking forward to it, Mr. Gamble. And he goes, you're going to love it out there. He goes, by the way, you were our next pick if Carl hadn't taken you on the board. So I was like, oh, my God, I could have been an eagle. Um, but um, but so, you know, we, we have this fraternity. And 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 we we met we met uh, uh, Coach Ree. He, he drove out from the city. He met us out in Delaware County. 
and uh, he had a sandwich with a bunch of, of old Eagles alums and a couple of other guys who were living in the area who weren't Eagles. And he said, because he wanted to really feel what it was like to be in Philadelphia. And, and right there in that moment, you know, I knew that I was going to like Andy Reid as, as the new head coach of the Eagles. And he did great things here. I, I, you know, he had, it says, you know, he's had an unbelievable past. I mean, everybody knows his past and he's not, he doesn't shy away from it. He's had some, some really tough things happen in his life. He's resilient. He's, he's, his players love him. And, um, you know, I don't care what anybody says, if, if, even if they don't win the Super Bowl this year, this is, it's not a failure. You know, it's only one team, you know, in February comes out on top. It's one, just one out of all 32 every year. And no team since the Patriots in early 2000s has done it twice in a row. And, you know, not every team, you know, even has winning seasons every year. Look at the, look at the 49ers, right? They, they're playing the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and, and now they're not even in the playoffs. Like, that's how fast it can change. And so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the kind of person that I'd rather, I'd rather be around a team that has a process for winning and has a consistent winning mentality and attitude that will get you those wins and, and give you the best chance to be successful than a, than a one and done. Let's pile all these guys into the locker room and see if we can get a Super Bowl. And if it doesn't fire the coach, fire the quarterback, fire the GM, fire the coordinators, you know, to me, that's no way to live. And I don't think that's really great for fans it, in the long run. You know, when I look back at those, those strings of teams in the nineties and those rabid chiefs fans, they were Awesome. You know, we look, we got close to the Super Bowl in, in 93 AFC championship game. You know, we were, that was as physically close as those teams in the nineties got. And then we were as, as psychologically close was that 13 and three season, you know, when we lost in the first round of the Colts or second round divisional game. And, and it's like, you know, the, the fans just kind of like, they just kept wanting more and more and more. And, and I think that was such a great environment and, 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 and you look back on Marty's career and what, the, the, what he brought. And we didn't win the Super Bowl, but, man, what a great environment they created. And I think, to me, that's what being a fan should be about. You know, I, I, I struggle with that a little bit in Philadelphia because you, you guys can't imagine what it's like here right now. With the, you know, we go I was going to ask. Philly, Philly, <laughs> you know, Nick Foles, you know, St. Nick <clears> – <throat> Doug Peterson, like you could, you could, you know, you couldn't get his time, like you couldn't get his time, right? Like Doug Peterson, oh, Howie Roseman, the GM of all GMs, right? And the fans are just, and now all of a sudden it's like fire him. It's like you listen to sports radio talk and it's like, oh my God, guys, we just won the Super Bowl. What was that three or four years ago? It's not, it wasn't that long ago. And, and they're just turning on themselves. And it's just like, it's just, that's to me, that's not what sports should be about. I, I want the days from when I was a kid. And, 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 and I think free agency has a lot to do with this guys. I really do. I I'm not, I'm not bashing it. Cause I think it hurt. I think it hurt me. I think I was a victim of that, those early years of the cap because I was in that middle class, right? I was the, the vested veteran who was hitting a certain amount of minimums in the salary range that wasn't a full-time starter that, you know, that, that the team could, you know, you know, you could get three rookies for what a guy in my bracket was making at that time. And it's like, we don't need you anymore because we have to deal with this cap thing, right? Where 80% of the players are, or 20% of the players are making 80% of the money. So you got to round your, your roster out, right? I think yeah. it's hurt the depth of the league. I think it's hurt the depth of special teams and all those things around it. But the, um, you know, the, 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 the salary cap is, has really hurt that ability to just root for your guy. It's like growing up, I didn't care if my Eagles were one in 15 or 15 and one, they were my guys year in and year out. Of course you had turnover and retirement and guys would get hurt and end their careers and things. But for the most part, you know, my formative years of watching the Eagles from the time I was, you know, <clears throat> six years old in 1975, all the way through, you know, when free agency kind of started right in yeah. the early, in the, in the early nineties, they were like the same guys year in and year out. You know, my nephew who's, you know, in his, his late twenties, early thirties, he's had like 15 Eagles jerseys. I had one, 
If you guys remember this name, his name was Bill Berge. He was number was 66. He was the star middle linebacker uh, for the Eagles during those years. I mean, of course you had guys like Ron Jaworski and Harold Carmichael, big wide receiver. Like they had some big names, but Bill Berge was the tough, rough and tumble middle linebacker. He had the full beard. You know, he was a guy that like everybody loves Bill Berge. I had one 66. I had Bill Berge Jersey my whole life. I wore it until it was like three sizes too small because he was my guy and they were all my guys, you know? And, and now today it's like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. rare just, man. It's just, hard for you. <clears throat> aside from that small hand. I mean, obviously like, you know, around here we'll have, I, I don't think we'll see a number 15 in another color for a while. Yeah. Just knock on yeah, wood no, yeah, for a whole bit, but yeah, it, it is totally different. Like just like, you know, those, and I mean, I grew up on, you know, the 03 sort of eras, you know, like the Tony Gonzalez's, you yeah. know, the Will Shields, the, uh, you know, Trent Green, you know, all those guys. But it, it's, it, it is interesting to think of just like how different it would have been if those guys could have just like been there their whole careers together. Like that's yeah. just, yeah, it's just, you don't it's think just, about it, but it's, hey, it's, we need that. Like sports needs that. Like the, to me, I, I know it's, you know, what is it? My daughters always say, okay, boomer. Right. My, my daughters <laughs> always say, you know, cause I, I always, you know, I always to walk to school uphill both ways, you know, in the snow, you know, we get, we get, we get nostalgic about some things, you know, Oh, well, when I, you know, we didn't have a stuff. We had to die rotary phone, you know? Mm-hmm. So of course you can get nostalgic about things, but I really do truly, I do truly miss that. I, I, I miss that aspect of, of sports where, year in and year out, you had, you know, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to use the, the genderist pronoun of guys or, you know, them, he, whatever, but like, just like, those were your guys, like for, for years, they were, you know, just, yeah, you get ready for the game. And when they lost, you were sad for them. You were sad for yourself. I just feel like today, you know, as much as I love sports, I love everything about sports and everything it teaches us. Um, I just, I miss those days of, <clears throat> that sort of community feel about professional sports. It's, it's sad that young people today don't get to experience that. Yeah. (coughs) I mean, now shifting away from sports a little bit, I mean, I know we've all been kind of living in this ridiculous, weird groundhog day sort of lifestyle. I'm curious, what is the man who has, you know, as many receptions as he does touchdowns do, you know, just to entertain himself outside of obviously watching the NFL, what has been your quarantine you know, the new add to your world as far as quarantining is concerned. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was Chris Carter before Chris Carter was Chris Carter. That's right. Zach, uh, I only catch touchdowns. Um, I always joke about that, you know, and, and the fact hey, that four I, for I, four, man, the, the team speaks for, for itself. I only had 193 to go to catch Jerry Rice. Um, if I played for another 60 years, I might have caught him. Um, but you know, <laughs> the yardage we won't talk about. Well, I did have, I did have, yeah, I did have something. 15, I did have 15 return yards. I had two kickoff returns for 15 oh. yards. Uh, one was for one yard. The other one was for 14. Uh, I'll just never forget looking over at Marty when the ball, they squibbed it to me. I was the, we called it the tight end position. It was one of the back, you know, positions off the front line. And I'll never forget. I literally looked over at Marty. I didn't know what to do. Like we, we never practiced it. We never like the, the ball came to me so fast. It got like squib kicked and I caught it off of like one bounce. And I'm look, I literally looked over at coach Schottenheimer and he went run. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, but what does a guy like me do? Well, you know, look, I have, um, you know, in quarantine itself, you know, it's boy, what, what it's done. I think Zach is it's, it's, it's forced a lot of people to work a lot longer. You know, uh, I'm in the insurance business. I'm, 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 I'm the chief operating officer of, of, a, of an insurance brokerages region in the Northeast. So I cover Boston, I cover Philly, and I cover New York. And, um, you know, I was traveling quite a bit before COVID. So number one thing it's done is it, it's really cut down on my travel. Well, not really. It's zero, my yeah, zero it's now. I've killed I'm, it, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Working yeah. from home. Um, I am... Um, so, 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 so I, I'm working a lot more because I don't have that. Some days it was a six hour commute. I would commute three hours to New York and then I would commute three hours home and I would do that uh, three days take a week. The train I, or what? I just, I take the train, you know, take the Amtrak and uh, cause I, I just don't Makes like, sense. I didn't like not being at home. So I, I'd rather, I'd rather commute. So, so I don't travel as much. So I spend more time at work. Um, I've been, been definitely working out a little bit more. Um, you know, I've really dived into dove into the podcast thing. So I'm really enjoying being prepared for that. Um, I am working on my MBA. 
Um, nice. I've been I've been doing that for the last couple of years. No, I, I went to Penn undergrad. I, I am at Villanova University. Still Go good. Cats, V's up. Um, uh, we won't talk about that Final Four then a few years ago. Yeah, uh, I was Kansas. just going to say that. I mean, we're both yeah. Kansas guys. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just not talk about that if that's cool. <laughs> yeah, we'll forget about that. So I, uh, I do get people sometimes when I'm walking around campus, they think I'm Jay Wright. But um, <laughs> hey, that is a great person to be mistaken. Yeah, for. I know, right? It's the hair. <laughs> like, I guess it's the hair. Silver Fox in it for sure. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I definitely don't dress as well as he does. Um, but hey, it's uh, a that's a high bar. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm very good friends with the with the team chaplain. So uh, so we we so I got good connections there. So I've been working on my MBA. Um, I teach a class. I teach a uh, there's a small liberal arts school outside of Philadelphia called Arcadia University. Um, I teach sports leadership uh, or I teach leadership in the sports management um, major. Um, any nice. any any student can take the class, but I generally get most because it's a required class for the sports management major. So I I teach leadership there as an adjunct professor. Um, you know, I travel has stopped with with my daughters and their college uh, stuff. They've all graduated. Um, so, you know, we're, uh, you know, so we're just kind of like, I'm just hunkered down, like just doing this all the time, like whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, meetings at work or doing my class or doing my class work with the students at Arcadia. It's just like constant, um, you know, on the screen. So it's a little, a little bit of fatigue from that perspective, but, you know, doing, doing all the techniques I can to get out, walk around. I, I love listening to podcasts. I, I, I like reading and, uh, you know, doing, doing, doing things with, uh, you know, ex, ex, expand the brain a little bit. So, but that's it. That's, you know, just trying to, trying to stay busy and, you know, got in, like I said, got in the insurance business, you know, right after I was done playing when I realized I had three kids that I had to get through college. Um, and, uh, my wife was like, okay, football thing's over. <laughs> go when you can, time to go to work, look at the time. So, uh, but been doing that for, for the last, uh, you know, 24 years. So it's been, been, been a really exciting to be in, in the industry. We were, uh, talking a little bit before we started recording and going live on our Facebook page. Um, I was complaining that I don't have a lot of room on my, on my one terabyte laptop. You, you said you had some interesting story i guess involving marcus allen with, with something like this oh god yeah as far as an, um i'm a big a big computer nut i love computers it's uh, for a long time it was like a hobby kind of I, I tried to learn a lot about computers and um and, and how they worked and everything and it, it was all sparked by marcus allen and and you know he was a techie like you wouldn't believe so what happened was in 1992 my wife and i got married my college roommate's dad uh, was 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 a big muckety muck at IBM, so he uh, for our wedding present I got a box. I don't th I still to this day I don't think I've ever gotten a box this big actually delivered to my house other than you know like when a refrigerator would come or something through through the through the uh, you know department store. But like this big giant box came and in the mail I was like what the heck I've never had a box delivered to me like this so. I open it up and it's like, you know, congratulations on the wedding, Joe. And and my college roommate and I were such great friends. His his dad was Uncle Bill. And his dad actually flew my entire family out. Like we, you know, <clears throat> I, I was never on a plane until I was 22. Until I flew to the East West Shrine game. Um, it's the first time I was ever on a plane. So, you know, we, we, we were not in the, in the realm of air travel at that point in my life. And um, he flew my entire family out to uh, California, to San Jose and to San Francisco to see me play in the East West Shrine game, which was, you know, so he was uncle Bill and always will be uncle Bill to me. So, so he sends me a scene. He's like, hey, congratulations on the wedding. And uh, you know, you and Jennifer were beautiful. He, Jennifer was beautiful. And I don't know what she's doing married to a guy like you. And, and he said, you know, enjoy the computer, uncle Bill. I'm like, what am I going to do with a computer? I'm, I'm trying to handle Derek Thomas every day at practice. He's sending me a computer, right? So, so my wife, Jennifer, was doing her graduate studies at the time, getting ready to, to be a teacher. And uh, so she's like, oh, this will be great. I'll use it. So it sat there for a little while, and, and she used it. Now, this IBM PS2 <clears throat> was, at that time, top of the I mean, top of the line. Like, my Uncle Bill was not messing around when he sent this thing. Like, this thing back then in $92 was probably five grand. It's probably a $5,000 computer back in 1992. And he gave it to us as a wedding present, right? So I, it sat in the box. You know, my wife was like, she'd like play solitaire on it or she'd do like 
back then it was called like word perfect, right? Which was the word. I don't even think we were using Excel at that point, right? Microsoft Excel. So, so, so I'm in the locker room one day and Marcus starts talking about computers and the internet. And I'm like, it's like going over my head. Like, what's he talking about? The internet, the email. And he's, and I said, well, I've got a computer at, at my house. My, my roommate's dad just uh, sent it to me last year for our, our wedding present. I, I just Googled IBM PS2. For those who don't know, because I have no idea what you were talking about. That's it. Is it, This is the, accurate? There, It looks like the, the one that's probably uh, far as in is the one in the bottom right. That looks most like it because it was a sit on the monitor, sit on that one right there. That's pretty okay. much what it looked like. And Is that even floppy disks at that point? It had, um, it did have the, um, it did have the hard, what are they? The three and a half inch hard disks. It wasn't the, it wasn't the big floppies that were, you know, like really floppy. It was those little hard floppy disks, mm-hmm. right? They were like, uh, like maybe three by five, maybe something like that. Or, or mm-hmm. so yeah, I think three and a half was right. Sounds yeah. right. So, so Marcus goes, you got a PS2? And I said, yeah, he goes, I'm sending Babu over to your house. And I was like, what, who's Babu? He's like, Babu Inesh. He's my computer guy. He's coming over to your house. He's going to get you set up on the internet. He's going to get you email. I'm like, Marcus. <laughs> He's like, well, email, you can send electronic mail. I'm like, who am I emailing Marcus? Like, and we laughed about that. Like we got the biggest, hit. but Babu came over. Nice. He was so and so smart, so intelligent, gets me all set up. I'm on the internet. And it was like, from then on, I was hooked. I was like hooked on this computer thing. And, and then I started like learning about it. And then when that kind of got a little bit older, I, I took it all apart. I, I took out the motherboard. I learned about it. I put in some new memory. But anyway, far as where you were going with this, we were talking earlier. We were talking about how you were afraid we weren't going to be able to record this because you didn't have enough memory. And you were saying you're in like the gigabyte range, right? 20, 30 gigabytes. Yeah, 20, right? yeah. Right? This hard drive, that whole hard drive of that computer that you showed, the whole hard drive, was 250 megabytes. So you couldn't even run program, like it couldn't store the programs. All the programs had to be run off a disk. So you had to have a disk for your word processing for a game that you wanted to play or like, you know, some some software that you wanted to use. You had to insert the disk. It didn't even have enough memory to run off of its own hard drive, um, which was crazy. So you think about it today, right? They make tiny little things you can go to Best Buy and get, you know, you can get 20 gigabytes on a little flashy drive thing, right? Yeah. You know, it's great. It's, it's insane. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, you know, when a lot of, a lot of players today, you know, they've got the social, you mentioned PS2. The only PS2 I know is a PlayStation 2. Right, exactly. And that's uh, why that's, yeah. So I wonder if there'd be a little confusion there. <laughs> well, I, the thing is, uh, you know, a lot of these athletes, you know, they'll, they'll go on social media during their downtime, online gaming, you know, you obviously got streaming services, Netflix, whatever, Disney plus when you, when you were a player, I, I know you talked about, you know, your time with, with KMPC and other internship opportunities, but for downtime to just chill and have fun, you know, as athletes, what did you guys do? Well, video games were fun. We still, you know, we had, I had a, um, I was big into uh, the Sega Genesis at that time, believe it or not. That was, that was the, the game. first one I ever had. It wasn't really Zach. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, that was game, you know, that was game system of choice back then. I grew up on, on game systems. We, we always, my brother always found a way for us to have video games. We, you know, we started with Pong and then we went to Atari and then we went to Intellivision and then we went to ColecoVision uh, which didn't last very long, but we so were I always, in, we, as, a, as a family, as brothers, we were always battling uh, over video games. Um, but so, yeah, so we, we, you know, we, we did in downtime, I would do some video games. Um, I remember getting, uh, I was on the cover of the Sega Genesis 1994 uh, with Joe Montana. I'm, I'm Bruce Smith. I'm dragging Bruce Smith down. Um, Wait, what's this called? The game? It, uh, it was, it was, uh, oh God, so it would have been NFL. Uh, it was Sega Genesis version of, of NFL, uh, would have been NFL oh, football 94 right there. Yeah. So, so if you look really closely, okay, <laughs> Joe's, Joe's on the cover, right? If you look really mm-hmm. closely, I'm the guy that Bruce, I'm trying to drag Bruce Smith down. And I think he may have hit Joe on that. Point. <laughs> 
on that play, to be honest, but the photographer caught it at, at just the right time. So if you look really closely, that face, so that's John that, Alt. That's, that's John you. Alt. If you look at Joe's left hand, right, his his pump mm -hmm. hand there, if you look, there's the 78, that's Bruce, and yeah. that's my face right there. Dragging that's Bruce awesome. Down. Also, managing to successfully block Bruce Smith might be you know, even more yeah. impressive than being on the uh, – cover of the game but that's awesome yeah so so oh, you know, geez 28 teams far as do you see that all what is that 28 teams that's back when there was 28 teams oh 28 oh oh yeah there you go so that's that's joe montana's scared face uh you know trying to avoid bruce smith because he can he can feel him coming you know joe was like patrick Mahomes; he had eyes in the back of his head and he, he just kind of knew bruce was coming but uh yeah so so yeah we played sega but i tell you we had you know we used to we had a bowling league Right. We, uh, we had a, we had a bowling league. We would go out, you know, our, uh, sniffing others and spouses definitely had, had really good friendships. So we'd have game nights and, and things like that. So we, we, you know, we, we had uh, a good chance for us to bond and in, in person and not, you know, and just kind of, I, I, I hope that the players still have all that and they're not tied up on the phones, you know, all the time with the social media stuff you know we were out in the community which I know all the players are today too but you know that was a big thing obviously playing back then was getting out in the community going to visit schools going to visit people uh, my wife Jennifer and I had our our foundation that we did uh, when I was there the program we had with Children's Mercy Hospital nice so I volunteered there I would go there every Tuesday and spend uh, every Tuesday with the kids and play games and, and make crafts and do things like that so just to, oh, just awesome. to kind of, you know, just kind of remember what life was all about mm -hmm. um, and keep it real. So, you know, my wife was teaching at the time. Um, she was a school teacher. So I spent time going to her classroom and yucking it up with the kids and, and, and some of the other teachers and stuff. So, you know, I, I, I hope that they all have that personal interaction and everybody's not caught up in, in the computers and things like that. I'm sure it's a different, it's probably a different era right now with COVID because, you know, I'm, I was talking about this with Jeff on our, on our, on our podcast and, you know, hoping that keeping our fingers crossed that the players, you know, with these two weeks off, I kind of consider last week a bye week, but yeah. you know, with these, with these couple of weeks off that they're, they're all doing the right thing, right. That they're, they're, they're keeping those bubbles going because we don't. Zach and I talked about that. I'm honestly amazed that like the teams themselves, especially like, you know, with the chiefs having a buy, I mean, for others, it might not be as feasible, but yeah, I'm amazed they didn't. Yeah, you know, that Clark doesn't have him just posted up somewhere. Hey, rent the whole hotel out for crying out loud! Oh, 100. You know, the hotels would out. be clamoring for it too. And, it's not and, like you know, yeah, it's be full good, anyway. Be good for everybody. I mean, even if you did have family there too, just to make yeah. a bubble, just make a big giant bubble. I've always kind of, I always had this thought earlier on in 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 sort of the quarantine. I, I always I always thought if they got down to the final four, if they would do like what the NBA did. You know, where they would just, like you said, post up in a city, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it would be, well, you know, it's the Super Bowls in Miami, right? So just post up in, in Miami and, and just, you know, just put everybody, four teams, AFC, play the AFC championship game on Saturday, NFC championship game on Sunday, take a couple weeks, play the next game and just do those last several weeks in a, in a place where all four teams could just be locked down for, you know, for the week before and, and just, just to, just to protect this long season that they've invested. Yeah. So I thought yeah. that's something they would do, but I don't know if that's, I think they're going to just keep going. I think that's what they're going to do. I'm genuinely surprised by that though. Cause like, I mean, like you said, protecting the work that they put into the season so far. I mean, I guess on one hand they've managed to get the season done, but you know, say it's, you know, the chiefs Packers in the Super Bowl, and you know, Patrick Mahomes can't play because of contact tracing or something like that yeah, doesn't right? count. I mean, like it counts, but it doesn't. Philip right? Rivers right. even expressed that concern before the season. Yeah. What if? Yeah. I mean, yeah. But it could be, make it even worse. What if it's him and Aaron Rodgers, and then you and then yeah. you don't even you know then you don't even have really Chad Henney versus who in the Super Bowl? Like, yeah, that'll get the ratings. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. So I, I, I just <laughs> that's the know, language they speak. Who knows, right? Who knows if if it's going to happen? And I know other sports have, you know, done it. And I thought that maybe they, I thought the NFL would. And uh, you know, and it's funny, Farzan, because I know we were also talking. About, <laughs> I keep looking at that Brett, uh, you know, the George oh, Brett yeah. jersey behind you. George Brett, we did a the Channel Nine did a thing where they came to our training camp one year in River Falls, Wisconsin, and 
you know, I happened to be, you know, there and they were like, Hey Joe, can we come up and, and see your room? Can you give us a tour of your, of your dorms? And like, like, all right. So I gave, I gave the camera people a, a, a tour of the room and, and I was showing them like the bed, you know, we used to take two twin beds and push them together. All we had in our dorm, they were classic college, four story dorm rooms, you know, cinder blocks, two beds pushed together, a dresser, a television and an air conditioner and a phone. That was it. That's all we had in our rooms. And, and it was really bare bones. Right. And, you know, we're eating cafeteria food catered by the cafeteria staff. And I'll never forget George Brett. I'm in the airport and I see George Brett and he comes over, he taps me on the shoulder. He says, Hey, Joe. I was like, George Brett, that's George Brett. Like it's a guy that, you know, I watched beat my Phillies, you know, in the world series and, or play and play against the Phillies in 1980, you know, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, George, he's like, I was like, first of all, you wreck it. Like, you know who I am? He goes, Joe, I got to tell you. He goes, I, I, I saw that thing they did on the news where they were interviewing you at your dorm room. He goes, if that's what spring training was like in baseball, he goes, I would have been out of the majors 20 years before, I, you know, because I never would have lasted that long. I was like, geez, George, it's not that bad. I mean, we get, you know, three hots in a cot. So uh, I, I can only imagine the type of, uh, you know, place you're staying at spring training but you know so every every time i think about george i think about that he's like joe i could have never i could have never made it in the nfl that's funny <laughs> oh good stuff man well hey, i never look. understood why they did training up in river falls that's always been a mystery to me yeah oh, it was the cheese league it was the cheese league you know i mean it was it was out there you know i mean it was funny because we we'd get up there and and you know there'd be like when I, well, first year I went was my rookie year. So I didn't know any different, right? I mean, I used to go see the Eagles practice here in Philadelphia when they were at Widener University, which is right around the corner from my house. Mm -hmm. And then they would go to Lehigh University. So like I had, I had you know, grown up seeing it. And, and, and because they were in the Philadelphia area, they had pretty decent number of fans. I mean, I remember going in 1991 up there and, you know, they had a parade and, you know, because the town was really excited. And, and, you know, but by the time the real interest waned, we'd have maybe a couple hundred people at practice, maybe, right? Like that was, and on a, that was like a scrimmage day, you know? Um, I'll never forget in 1993, we were coming out of the, of the area where we dressed and had our meetings and you could, it was a blind turn to see the stadium. And it was a typical division three stadium, probably sat 5,000 fans, you know, wood bleachers or whatever, and nice press box. And uh, we're coming around the turn and Alex Gibbs, who was our line coach was, was leading us out to practice. And, you know, he was all of, you know, five foot nine, right. We're only six foot five guys following him. And he stopped, Whoa, Whoa, boy. And he had this awesome, like Southern North Carolina accent. He's like, Whoa, Whoa, boys, boys. He goes, uh, listen to that. Listen to that crowd. And like, you could hear like, like you could hear this, the din of like a crowd. And, and, and we're like, are they pumping like noise into like the speakers? Like what's going on? We turn the corner and there's 5,000 people packed in. All we're in is helmets, t-shirts and shorts for a stretch and like a quick run through on our first day. Cause you had to have that acclimation period. And he goes, I'm gonna tell you something, boys, they ain't here to see you. <laughs> so we're all looking at each other like, yeah, we know why they're here. And he goes, let me tell you something. Your jobs, Marcus, Joe, they got a whole lot more important this year. All right, let's go have a good practice. You know, we're like, oh, God. And like, we're all like biting our nails at that point, knowing that things had really changed. And that's when I, like, it wasn't Kansas City. It wasn't all the hype that, that Joe got during mini camp. It was that moment in time when I knew that the Kansas City organization had taken a turn. And, and that was like the tipping wow. moment for me. When, when I saw 5,000 people in River Falls, Wisconsin to see Joe Montana, I knew things were going to get really interesting over the next couple of years. And they did. And they really did. And I think, you know, as much as Marty was building that team, 89, 90, 91, you know, 92, you know, because Chris, the Christian Okoye era had ended, we all wondered what was going to be the next thing. And let me tell you, that's what Marty and Carl did that was the next thing. And that's what Mr. Hunt did. And I think that was really, to me, ended that big drought of those years from the Len Dawson era of the Super Bowl. You know, we know how bad things were from a franchise perspective, wins and losses. To me, 
that was like the tipping point moment right there where it just went and the chiefs were on the map 5,000 people river falls wisconsin now i'll never forget that moment that's awesome that's pretty cool hey joe uh i know we could talk to you for hours and hours uh i know we've got a little over over a little longer than we usually do so i definitely appreciate you being generous oh, with your my, time my pleasure i'm sorry if i got chatty and, and just no kept chatting, but i just love chatting with you guys and, and sharing those stories and you know <laughs> it's just it's fun stuff it's fun to relive they're great memories you know um you know thanks for having me on and, and getting to share some stuff with you guys and you know excited for the you know for the chiefs fans that do listen i know you're switching your gears and everything but i know you probably have a really nice following of of Chiefs fans. I'm oh, excited yeah. for them this year, excited for what they're going to do, and i um, really excited about just in general about this playoffs. I, I I really am. I think it's a great field that we have this year in this in this tournament, so to speak, using some, you know, sweet uh, 16, you know, parlance from from March Madness, but I think it's a really nice field. I I'm 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 I think it's going to be Chiefs Bills in the Super Bowl. Um I mean, in the AFC, AFC championship oh, okay. AFC game, um, I think that I think that's what, what's going to happen. I, 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 if the Colts can upset the Bills, I fear them because I fear their defense. Um, I also think the Ravens are really on on the rise right now. So I think we're obviously going to play the winner of that game. If you know, I think the Steelers and the Bills are both going to win. I, I, I do, and I think you know. So the winner of that. Uh, you know, that, uh, that game, that Titans, um, Ravens game, I, I, I think it's going to be the Ravens. And I, I whew, you know, they ran, for, they ran for 400 yards in, in, in a recent game. So that's going to be, that's going to be something else um, to see. So I, I'm just really excited about this field in the AFC. I think the AFC is, I think the AFC is the, is the conference to beat myself. Yeah, I for really sure. Do. There's a lot of great the teams there. there. I think the Chiefs are the best team in the NFL, and I think the AFC is the best conference. So we've got a lot of luck. We got a lot going on right now. Well, if you want to hear more of Joe's commentary, check out his podcast over at the Believe Podcast Network. Uh, Joe Valerio, uh, thank you so much, man. Uh, we're definitely going to do this again. We'll keep in touch, and uh, we'll bring you back on again sometime. Definitely, Farson. Thanks so much, Zach. Take have a great one, guys. All right, take care, Joe. Thank, thank you. Joe.